privilege to be able to talk to our members of the healthcare community, especially respiratory therapists, as this topic is very close to and near and dear to our hearts. As we've all been kind of struggling to try and figure out this world that we're in with this new virus, COVID-19. So my objective goals today are really to talk specifically to the non-invasive respiratory support as we know it based on today's information. So I don't have any disclosures relevant to today's uh, lecture outside of, of claiming that the information that I mostly will be sharing is things as we know it today. And as we are all familiar with in this environment, it's a constantly changing world with changing guidelines and recommendations. But based on what we know today, I hope to touch on a few objectives in terms of looking specifically to efficacy related mostly to high flow therapy and non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. A lot of obviously what we know comes from previous outbreaks with viruses of SARS and MERS specifically, but there are a few and emerging cases and documentation regarding COVID-19. So I hope to touch on that today. I also want to spend some time talking about the cases in terms of equipment related considerations that we definitely want to be kind of aware of and maybe consider in our bedside approach so we stay safe. So a good place to start is kind of looking, this, this is the John Hopkins coronavirus map as it was of yesterday anyway, and, and it definitely, I don't need to share this with everyone in terms of how the impact uh, this virus has had, not just in our local communities and lives, but on a much broader scale over the last six to eight months. Another thing that I think about when I look at this map is, one, we've all been pretty busy out there during this unprecedented time, especially in respiratory, being the forefront in a lot of um, the management of these cases. But also, how does this impact other areas of the world where, and also counties that we work amongst, where limited resources are available to them? Recently, um, in, in the September Journal, Respiratory Care Journal, there was discussion on this and they, they were talking about resource communities and countries where availability to ICU level ventilators may be less than 10 in their entire country. So I think the discussion and relevance about talking about non-invasive respiratory uh, support is, is really kind of prevalent when we think about things in that context. So currently, depending on the guidelines that you look at, it is believed that it's estimated 5 to 12 percent of hospitalized COVID patients will require advanced care. So that basically leaves 88 to 95 percent of other hospitalized patients requiring other forms of respiratory support. And when it comes to even them looking at high income countries where they have availability to um, higher level resources, mortality has still been uh, related anywhere from 67 to 81 percent when it comes to treatment with mechanical ventilation. When you look specifically at highly specialized centers, that mortality is a little bit lower. But as time has gone on, we're learning that non-invasive respiratory support devices may play a larger role in the care of COVID patients than we originally thought. So in looking at the mechanism of what is believed to play a role in, in and how COVID-19 affects the lungs, Dr. Gattinoni reviewed a lot of cases that were coming out of Italy and China and, and saw some observations that might really kind of help us predict the variability that we see oftentimes with COVID. So he speculated two kinds of patient types, if you will, an H type and an L type where the H type kind of reflects a patient with nearly normal compliance, but is hypoxic. In our institution, we like to refer to these patients potentially as the happy hypoxic group. Other people refer to it as the silent hypoxemic group. But in this situation, BQ matching is, is almost normal and the lungs themselves are not full of edema. So in terms of weight, they're not usually having an issue and at least in the earlier stages. And therefore, they may not re respond to recruitability methods. So intubating patients in this group, the outcomes may not be quite as favorable 
But the other group that he speculates is a little bit more of an ARDS type presentation. Obviously, this group has lower compliance and we're starting to lose volume in the lung, but are usually attributed to increasing edema and loss of compliance. But there's a, sh a right to left shunt um, issue also happening with cardiac output in non-aerated tissue areas of the lung. And as time is going on, obviously the lungs get heavier as the edema gets worse. And this is the kind of patient that may respond to more recruitable kind of strategies. So another piece to this is looking at what's kind of potentially going on in the small vessels of the lung where um, the hypercoagulopathy also associated with COVID-19 kind of supports that it's not completely a ventilation problem and that there are other issues going on, not just in the lungs, but as we all know, throughout the body of these patients. So looking at patient reported symptoms, obviously they're widespread and varied as we've all heard about and seen, obviously ranging from mild to severe. But when we do look at the, the main reported ones as were reported in Lancet, respiratory complications are actually found in the higher part of, of the list of reported sim symptoms. So our non-invasive support would definitely be helpful. So as we start to think about these patients as they come in, is to kind of really think about what tools we have in our toolbox. And a wise mentor um, of mine has always said to treat the patient and not the numbers. And in light of COVID-19 and the variability of response, this kind of seems like a very fair assessment. We looked at the respiratory pyramid and starting with just general oxygen therapy up to high flow CPAP and bilevel, and then obviously um, progressing to mechanical ventilation and ECMO if, if the disease progresses that far. But once the patient has hit that peak of illness, these modalities also play a role on the recovery side for the patient as well. So that there is quite a bit of importance that we, we understand what works best for these patients, but we might not get specific answers to this for quite some time. And some of that kind of comes along with that COVID-19 being a new virus to humans has not really prepared us with a large volume of randomized controlled trials or reviews to help guide us in appropriate care for patients with COVID-19. So much of what we know is from previous outbreaks of SARS, MERS, and H1N1, and also from expert opinion from people that were working with this early on in terms of what they were seeing. So as I said, it may take some time for us to truly understand what um, outcome metrics work the best when it comes to COVID-19, but the randomized controlled trials are obviously very difficult to handle at this current time, especially in face of a lot of patients needing care. So we look to our organizations and to help provide some context and early guidance. COVID-19 was emerging and, and there was a lot of difference in terms of the messaging here. So the World Health Organization had asked for a review to be put together, and that's what this paper is reflecting, the differences in outcome between ventilation techniques and possible risks with transmission of COVID-19. They looked at 123 studies, but actually only ended up with five that were found that could potentially answer the questions to some degree of um, confidence. Overall, they concluded there was indirect and low certainty evidence, especially around non-invasive um, positive pressure ventilation in comparison to IMB. And so that, that jury is still a little bit out. The five studies went on to, to be broken down as one involving COVID, three with SARS and one with MERS. So when we look to the specific groups, um, however, there were some overriding um, trends that we were seeing in the sense that high flow seems to be favored over non-invasive -posit non positive pressure ventilation. And several, several organizations actually recommended against using high flow. Uh, and keep in mind, this was fairly early on when the risks to exposure were not really clear or as clear as they might be today. But if non-invasive positive pressure ventilation was used, there was some um, support in using CPAP perhaps over a bi-level pressure support. And in certain patient populations for a selected period of time with incredibly close monitoring and strong support to intubate early. 
When we look kind of to a little closer to home is the Society for Critical Care Medicine guidelines. Obviously, this is an international reach. And they detailed a, a very detailed guide in the Surviving Sepsis Campaign in terms of management for adults with COVID-19. This continued the, the support for conventional oxygen with the thought of um, keeping the saturation above 92% in terms of suggestion of starting points and definitely favored um, high flow as an option um, in some patients that were tolerating being not intubated. Close monitoring obviously was a continued message in terms of need for intubation, as was a negative pressure room and fitted respiratory mask. Their guidelines also um, was uncertain on the evidence around helmet CPAP that we'll discuss a little bit later in the presentation. So the National Institutes of Health also second these recommendations suggesting starting with conventional O2 followed by high flow and a closely monitored trial of non-invasive positive pressure ventilation in the absence of a need to intubate or high flow availability. So the kind of question sort of gets me thinking is in these modalities, they, they actually treat symptoms and not diseases specifically. So when we look to maybe some of the, the concerns around non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, a lot of the studies with acute hypoxic respiratory failure involve populations that are immunocompromised or having COPD exacerbation or cardiogenic pulmonary edema, and they're not really related to viral effects of respiratory failure. Outside of those three um, categories, non-invasive ventilation has had a high failure rate on the, on the average of about 50%. High flow, on the other hand, has had increasing attention over the last years and showing some improved mortality potential at 90 days in some studies, and obviously some reduction in intubation and reintubation in patients that have been extubated. This compared to exposure risks is likely for maybe some of the stronger support for one modality over the other. But another consideration that we shouldn't ever forget about is the mechanics of the patient connected to the devices. As we know, when patients are in respiratory distress, they demand typically more flow as distress is getting worse. When they're attached to a non-invasive positive pressure device, this can result in some pretty high tidal volume delivery. We know high tidal volumes in terms of ARDS is not a good thing to have happen, and this in turn can increase the transpulmonary gradients and aggravate existing injury that's taking place. For COVID-specific patients, additional concerns around risks of exposure and delayed intubation, um, also increasing chances of exposure, have, have been at the forefront of a lot of discussion around the non-invasive positive pressure ventilation population or use. So if we kind of break the modalities a little bit apart, and, and again, we're looking at them treating symptoms and not so much diseases, is to look at the mechanism of action and see how this may or may not support patients at various uh, progression with COVID-19. We know that patients exhibiting um, respiratory distress may require flows that are typically four to five times greater than their current minute ventilation needs. And it's speculated, and hopefully this animation will play, that at higher flow rates, we can actually wash out the nasal pharynx and stabilize it with a, a higher percentage of FiO2 if, if that flow rate is above what the patient's needs are, and, and reduce the air entrainment around the cannula when the flow is high. It also might have a slight ventilatory effect in when it does this in, in removing some CO2. So Moeller et al. Um, in a physiology journal, this is pre-COVID-19, took a look at 10 volunteers that he randomized in a crossover study using a gamma camera to see the effect of CO2 removal when patients were on high flow. And what you can kind of see in this depiction is that at lower flow rates, there's still CO2 in the upper airways specifically. But as we start to get to flow rates around that 40, 45, 50, 60 liter per minute range, that um, actually drops off quite a bit. So there might be a, an advantage as we increase flow with high flow, 
in benefiting patients, especially when we're trying to minimize progression with um, distress. So a comparable study, again, pre-COVID, looking at high flow versus another favored device that we oftentimes use is the Venturi mask. And overall, in this particular study, they were looking at post-extubation criteria, and they observed in that study an improvement in the PF ratio and a trend towards a reduction in CO2 and lower respiratory rates. And this was seen, obviously, over a period of time. Again, supporting that in the post-extubation period of a COVID patient, this also might support that patient at that time. When we look to our trach patients, again, um, this crossover study, it was very small with only 26 patients in it, but what they were attaining to look at was the differences in response to a high flow trach adapter versus standard oxygen delivered via an HME. And what the results kind of alluded to, flow rates on the high flow of 10, 30, and 50 liters per minute, when the flow rates were very similar, and there was not a big, huge difference in terms of response for a trach patient, this was speculated predominantly to be the mechanism of how airway pressure exhibited in this kind of patient. There was some slight increase with expiratory pressure with the HME, and, and they were kind of talking about that the device, the HME device itself, creating a little bit more of that back pressure resistance versus high flow kind of generating um, pressure that the patient, or sorry, the patient is breathing against a flow rate. And so the distension of back pressure kind of maybe isn't quite comparable um, between the two devices. However, they did um, suggest in, in further reading of this is that the high flow device may be more consistent with its airway pressure over the, the HME. As they saw flow increasing, however, and at the higher flow rates, respiratory rate did trend lower in the trach patients as the flow also went up. They did not see a big difference in CO2 clearance between these patient groups. Tracheal pressure was reported to, to be a little differently in some in five of the patients that they actually looked at the effect before and after decannulation. And so comparatively, they concluded that standard oxygen via HME, that you would need a higher flow rate criteria, upwards of 50 liters per minute, to have the effect of improved oxygenation and, and pressure effect when using a trach adapter. At similar gas flow rates, things seem to be somewhat comparable um, with a slight improvement in and pressure effect potentially with the HME device. So controversy has been around this issue for some time as to what is the effect that this back pressure in terms of uh, the flow can generate in the airways. Is it enough to generate PEEP? Is it PEEP? Is it not like PEEP? Neonatal data kind of is has been reported anywhere from 0.2 centimeters of water pressure upwards of 4.8 centimeters. And in healthy adults, it has ranged also from five to about eight centimeters of pharyngeal pressure in, in either healthy subjects or models. But what was interesting with this particular group by Carly et al. is that they used impedance tomography to try and get a better understanding of what is kind of going on at various flows. So they looked at a small subset of post-op cardiac patients that have PF ratios less than 300, reported dyspnea and obviously increased respiratory rate. And these patients were placed on standard O2 via cannula or a face mask. And they compared this to high flow at flow rates of 35 and up to 50 liters per minute. The images at the top of the screen kind of show you in a pictorial version of what the end expiratory lung index was in terms of inflation. And off to the left-hand side here, you kind of see the low flow delivery system versus off on the right-hand side, you kind of see the flow rate up at 50 liters per minute. There was statistical significance in this study um, towards respiratory rate PF ratio and SAT response in improvement, and patients subjectively reported that worker breathing was improved on the high flow system. When they looked at the effect has been debated in, in many um, discussions on, on the pressure conversation around high flow, 
whether the effect is consistent when the mouth is opened and closed. And in this particular study, at least using this technology, they found that it really wasn't significantly different in terms of pressure from open to close. It was quite small, except when we kind of got up into this higher flow range. And it's not surprising that this higher flow range is oftentimes reported, at least more recently, as a good starting point for starting high flow. And we see this consistency, even maybe potentially with the mouth open and closed, having a pressure effect as well. What they also kind of talked a little bit about was when they looked at the airway pressure, specifically the low flow group and the high flow group, is that it wasn't a consistent pressure. I know over time I've heard people kind of refer to high flow as a poor man CPAP. And even though airway pressure is generated in the airway, this particular study suggested that the pressure is not continuous and that it actually fluctuates up and down from inspiration to expiration. And it's kind of during expiration that that pressure is at that higher range. And that makes sense when patients are breathing against a lot of flow. When we compare it to the low flow category of patients, though, they kind of oscillate around zero centimeter um, of pressure effect. So we might have a little bit of effect on recruitment, some low level pressure that might aid patients, especially with COVID-19. So another consideration, and again, going back pre-COVID-19, was a lot of discussion around using high flow as an option during apneic pause during intubation. And this has been discussed with quite vigor as possibly aiding, preventing some desaturation events during the intubation efforts. For COVID patients, Tran et al. Uh, did some review of potential exposures to healthcare workers, and they estimated, based on what they could find, that intubation had a greater risk of about six times higher than um, traditional risk and three times likely when compared to bagging. High flows exposure was very low. And in this particular group, they, um, in the British Journal of Anesthesia, they compared 50 liters of high flow versus the 15 liters via resuscitation bag. So what they found was that the time to intubation was actually a little faster in using the high flow um, group, and the saturation limit during intubation didn't seem to fall as much as it did with the standard oxygen group with the ambubag. And the number of events requiring mask ventilation or bagging was actually lower in the high flow group. So when we start to think about this in regards to risk exposure, you know, bagging and intubation being potentially those high, high events that can lead to us being at risk, potential for high flow um, being used during intubation could help um, with some of that process. When we look to a frequently viewed paper um, that when it came out in 2015 in the New England Journal of Medicine, it kind of were looking at these modalities um, as kind of a comparison. And this obviously was looking at patients with acute hypoxic respiratory failure. The, the criteria to, to be enrolled was a PF ratio less than 300, and the patients couldn't be hypercarbic. 64% of the patients in the study did have community-acquired pneumonia as an underlying diagnosis. And their effort was to kind of look at the number of patients that where they were intubation occurred within by day 28 and number of ventilator-free days at day 28. The interventions were 10 liters of non-rebreather versus 50 liters of high flow, and non-invasive was delivered via an ICU ventilator with a pressure support adjustment for 7 to 10 ml per kilo ideal body weight. PEAK was adjusted to keep the SAT greater than 92%. They did meet their goals in, in some of these areas in terms of that there was a trend difference um, towards less intubation. And this was more apparent when they looked at the patient population with a PF ratio less than 200. The, the concern that kind of you want to think about potentially with this study was in, in some of the design and the setup. The non-invasive ventilator patients um, were on the non-invasive for only eight hours a day, twice a day, typically. And the rest of the time, they spent time on high flow. So there was a little inconsistency there and maybe how the non-invasive patients fared. And the target goals for tidal volume delivery in the non-invasive positive pressure group 
was between, like I said, seven to 10 ml per kilo. That seemed a little high to me in terms of, I don't know if that would have had any effect um, in the overall goal being that that tidal, higher tidal volumes can potentially lead to aggravating lung injury. But when it comes to ventilator for few days, the, the non-invasive group actually did a little bit better. And the FIO2, when you looked at the averages between the high flow group and the non-invasive positive pressure group, the actual FIO2 was lower when pressure was applied. And that, that kind of makes sense. Pressure kind of using, um, recruiting some of these patients, um, I would hope that the FIO2 would will come down, come down a little bit. But the study overall is, free, like I said, frequently viewed and, and referenced, but it may not have had a full fair view for the non-invasive patient population. But for high flow, it definitely shows some significant benefits. So as we start thinking about starting where to start on high flow in terms of flow rates, so this is a, a nice summary table kind of speculating where when you line up the majority of papers on the topic, you kind of see this trend around the 50 to 60 liter per minute mark being that consistent starting point. A lot of people suggest that starting high and working low, capturing the patient, and then trying to wean makes the most sense. And in certain patient populations, for example, with COPD, these uh, starting points would be modifying for them. So if we added self-proning, and, and this has become fairly popular, at least in our institution, about looking at using these devices and, and combining it with patients being able to prone themselves, you know, this particular study um, kind of showed some possible benefits in being able to do this. So it was observational in nature, um, and this was in two teaching hospitals in China. It was a relatively small sample size of patients because this was the early days, um, and, and like I said, to just a couple of institutions. Half of the cases were viral in nature, and 10 fit into a moderate ARDS category, and the other 10 had more of a severe ARDS-like picture. They were started on non-invasive positive pressure ventilation on CPAP and BiPAP mode and a PEEP of five, and then they were switched to high flow at 60 liters or they remained on the non-invasive positive pressure. What they kind of observed was that the PF ratio did increase in both the prone groups by about 25 to 35 millimeters of mercury. Overall, the conclusions were that early proning on high flow and non-invasive, it was pretty well tolerated. It didn't require a lot of intervention from people at the bedside. And that for the moderate ARDS group, about half of them appeared to be avoid intubation. And when they further looked at the group that failed and went on to being intubated, 78% of those actually have PF ratios under 100. And so that kind of supported the conclusion that severe ARDS may not be the, the appropriate way to handle this and further supports what we saw in the guidelines about not waiting to intubate on some of these patients and watching them pretty carefully. But overall, well tolerated and for some patient could ward off intubation and improve um, oxygenation. So what if we were able to predict when we put patients on high flow, who might be at risk over time or over different shifts, you know, when we're coming and going, who they fare better on high flow and who might be the patients we have to keep a closer watch on. So Roca and all found this predictive index where they looked at various time points and speculated and looked at success rates in terms of those that went on to being intubated. So the, uh, the ROX index is simply the saturation divided by the FO2 and divided by the respiratory rate. And what they found in looking at time windows of two, four, six, and 12 hours and beyond was that there was predictive cutoffs around the 12 hour mark, a, a ratio um, less than 4.88 seemed to indicate with a high degree of specificity that the patients may be failing on high flow. And so that might give us some indice watching these patients a little more carefully. They also speculated cutoffs um, potentially at two hours of less than 2.85 and at six hours less than 3.42 as being trends that we can watch over long periods of time. And especially as we're all changing shifts somewhat frequently, we may not be there to subjectively see how the patient has done hour by hour during the day. 
but the index might, might yield some information that would be useful at the bedside. So this was further explored in, in a, a single center retrospective review um, published in intensive care and, and they kind of looked at the ROCS index specific to COVID hypoxic respiratory failure. And they too continued to measure several times a day until the patients ended up being intubated or weaned from high flow. They initiated high flow at a pretty high FO2 of 80% when the SAT was 96% on a regular O2 delivery system. High flow was started at 50 liters, but it averaged about 40 to 60 liters per minute. And what they found in their trial, that 34% of the cases um, succeeded on high flow, they never got intubated and discharged, and 63% of the cases did go on to requiring mechanical ventilation. What they found with their ROCS index, though, sensitivity seemed to be a, a pretty good marker at the four-hour window, so the, I'm sorry, the first four hours of high flow. And again, when the guidelines are all suggesting that we, we be hypervigilant on our monitoring of these COVID patients, having this index really being a good reflection, especially as we get really busy and can't be there all the time, might be really helpful to consider as another tool in our toolbox. Their ROCS value was a little different than the ROCA study. They were looking at a value of 5.37 in terms of ratio, and they attributed that to a unique nature of the COVID lung injury itself. It's something that else that we can use in our toolbox. Again, identifying patients who are failing to not delay intubation is one of their key criteria for consideration. So when we kind of start to think about the patients that may fail from high flow and require possibly some non-invasive um, pressure ventilation, we know from pre-COVID guidelines that, that there is a high failure rate in patients outside of COPD exacerbation and uh, cardiogenic pulmonary edema. But a short-term trial of one to two hours under the right conditions for certain patients is definitely made it into the guidelines. And as we discussed earlier, the concerns really revolve around how the patient is responding to therapy. If they're still working hard against the machine, um, we have kind of some potential risk associated with aggravating injury. And obviously patients that who have a PF ratio supportive of more of an ARDS type pector may not fare well, obviously, on non-invasive um, modalities. There's been a lot of discussion about the modality in non-invasive, whether we should be using just CPAP and not applying a change in pressure on top of that, whether that could be more helpful to these patients. But again, no concrete evidence um, suggests one, one way over the other. But when we kind of look to what's been done across the world, you know, we know what we do here at home and what our standards of care are. But when we kind of look to this, this was a letter that was submitted to critical care earlier this year, and they kind of, they tabulated kind of quite nicely, at least from available information, that the use of non-invasive is definitely very varied. And it was a go-to option in Italy. And in fact, the Italian Thoracic Society, who also uses high flow, utilized helmet CPAP, oftentimes over traditional mask interfaces with non-invasive coughing pressure. Their early recommendations and suggestions found that it was helpful in certain patients as opposed to putting a mask interface on. So this particular study done at the University of Chicago kind of looked at this in a little bit more detail. This was a randomized clinical trial at a single center and these patients were admitted to the IC with ARDS. Their goal was to determine whether the helmet could reduce the rate of intubation and improve outcome over a mask interface. So part of this study kind of helps us understand if we're gonna use an interface like this, how would we may go about using it? So the helmet was connected to a dual limb ventilator as those two ports coming out of a helmet interface, and they had to increase the pressure support levels to generate a flow around 100 liters per minute in order to avoid CO2 rebreathing. To minimize the synchrony, they also had to make sure that the, the ventilator was set to a really fast rise time, and they cycled off at around 50% of max flow. 
So the MAS group on, was uh, managed a little differently. They were um, connected to a single limb non-invasive ventilator. And obviously that the differences between the two devices is something that we should consider when it comes to outcomes for, for this particular study. But what they did show with some significance was that the helmet appeared to reduce intubation in the patients that were treated with it from around 18% got intubated versus 61% in the, the face mask group. In terms of ventilator-free days, the helmet also seemed to have some improvement in survivability and time off the ventilator. So challenges around the study um, obviously kind of highlight that there was an eight-hour window in the study design when they were on non-invasive with a face mask before they randomized to the two different modalities for non-invasive. But their overall conclusion met their key metric goals, which was to uh, show a reduction in intubation of around 18% versus 61% in the non-invasive positive pressure group. So it was suggested that the helmet group might have had a slight advantage and that higher PEEPs were also used in this particular study for the helmet group. So like I mentioned earlier, in Italy, the helmet, uh, a first line response, and they definitely utilized and showed that the proning was fairly tolerated with minimal healthcare worker needed interventions. It was felt that the helmet when applied with appropriate filters to minimize some of the concern around exposure and, uh, as compared to uh, non-invasive masks. They also further put a, a caveat in there about being watching patients with CO2 above 50 when using the helmet um, very carefully as if there is a helmet deflation, um, some patients can get into a little bit of trouble. So other key considerations that they shared was using a conventional ventilator with a dual limb circuit seemed to fare a little bit better. Um, consider starting out with CPAP and reserving inspiratory pressure ranges only if needed for uh, some work of breathing if it's not to the extent of needing intubation. Their recommendations were increasing those levels about 50% over what we would normally do potentially with a mask interface. And like I already mentioned, they talked about the dyssynchrony part and having to make some adjustments to help the patient synchronize with the, the ventilator using this particular interface. And again, the guideline continues with not delaying intubation for patients where this isn't responding. So when we kind of look at patient tolerance, there has been a lot of suggestion that the helmet over standard non-invasive positive pressure masks minimizes things like claustrophobia and possibly aspiration risks, and the patient has a high risk of communication. But others have suggested that communication can still remain frustrating for patients, especially the older patients, in that it can be sometimes difficult for them to hear things. And if the humidity isn't uh, held consistently, the helmet can fog up, creating challenges to see the patient. So when I looked at these images, comes to an animation there, three very different images. So one is product literature, where uh, she looks pretty happy in her little helmet there. Um, and on the other side was our RT director, took one for the team in trying this on to get a feel for or how this was. And then we have this image from a patient, a real patient in it with a, on the NBC website. So the jury might really still be out on whether this is a, a, a more or less comfortable situation, but there are some uh, take homes from, from it as we haven't been able to use it in the United States until somewhat recently with the Emergency Use Act for us to explore this uh, modality and potential into the future. So in switching gears a little bit from like when and how the devices and modalities potentially could work is to, to really kind of think a little bit about how we go about applying in our everyday practice some of the things that we're doing around the modalities. So Cran et al. published in PLUS One a meta-analysis of 10 studies, mostly during the SARS outbreak, that kind of suggested the intubation airway manipulation objectives of what we do kind of hold maybe the highest risk 
But when you look into this in a, in a little bit more detail, in the 10 studies, one study was, there was only one study involving high flow. So we definitely still have to stay vigilant and not read too much into these numbers in terms of, of us being at higher risk versus other things. I think that with more information, we'll probably have a better understanding of how that really looks uh, with, in regards to COVID-19. But this particular group published in infectious disease, and they looked at using high fidelity mannequins at a lot of different oxygen delivery systems, including non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. And they too speculated that high flow and non-rebreathers were definitely the more preferred route in terms of exposure risk or potential exposure risk in terms of distance from the patient exhalation. So this one was actually studied using nasal high velocity insufflation, and they were looking at the effects published in chest not so long ago at the use of a surgical mask on and off at different flow rates. What they did find um, from flows of six and 40 liters per minute with oxygen therapy was that a surgical kind of mask covering could capture around 83% of particles. Again, supporting that we have to still um, remain vigilant on our PPE, but it was a little bit reassuring compared to what you saw or what you do see on the other side of the screen where there is no um, mask covering. They additionally looked a little deeper into how ventilation might be affected when it comes to using high flow and then covering the patient with a, a mask covering. And they did find there was a little bit of an impact on CO2 clearance of around 37% at flows around 35 liters per minute, but suggested that at higher flow rates, this issue might be overcome. And, and there's definitely a need for further testing on this for us to get better answers. More recently, um, we have one of our fellow RTs, uh, Felix said has the vapor farm company and did design this kind of modification to the face tank set up to negative pressure. And Felix is the director of respiratory therapy at New York Presbyterian. And obviously he got specialty practitioner of the year. So he does a lot of, of good work for us in our field. And in his design, his thinking was that when the pressure or the negative pressure might create an environment that patients might tolerate a little bit more than the surgical mask covering. And some early simulation data, as you see at the bottom of the screen, kind of supports that that might be possible. So we hope to hear a little bit more from Felix on this over time, but it might be an alternative to patients that are having difficulties wearing that uh, mask covering with high flow therapy. So specific to the interfaces themselves, I think overall um, we see that potentially avoiding O2 setups that have entrainment ports in them, kind of like the Venturi may not be the best options. Having patients using high flow with a mask covering could help mitigate some of the exposure risks that we are worried about with high flow. And some other bench studies kind of um, alluded to that it's really key on the patient wearing the cannula appropriately so that it's sized appropriately and positioned in the nares correctly. And then obviously weaning flow would be uh, advantageous to minimize exposure. When it comes to the non-invasive positive pressure interfaces, a non-vented mask seems to be the, the choice uh, or the number one choice, followed by that oral, na oral nasal and full face mask. Appropriate fit follows these recommendations as well. And some, some study data from you et al kind of uh, spoke to avoiding using nasal pillows and nasal interfaces specifically for increased exposure risks. You might want to consider the helmet as, a, as an option in the toolbox. And when it comes to circuit exhalation systems, you know, maybe there is a preference to that dual circuit uh, design versus whisper swivel valve type systems, which can aerosolize into the environment. And obviously, we have to be very vigilant on our filters. Um, when they're saturated, their performance is going to go down. Filters are kind of key in trying to mitigate some of this exposure risk with non-invasive. So like I mentioned, Hugh et al. kind of demonstrated some of this in a simulated human experiment where they were looking at smoke concentrations in 
uh, in models of normal, mild, and severe injury. And they were connected to a single limb circuit for bilevel ventilation. And they looked at the air dispersal. And this was, again, with a, a not filtered setup, but it was in a negative pressure environment with 12 air exchanges per hour. And they looked at two different kinds of helmets and the face mask bilevel ventilation setup. For the total face mass, which is kind of what we're looking at here, and the imaging is a little hard to see, as pressure increased, from, inspiratory pressure increased from 10 to 14 to 18, they definitely saw that the velocity of expiratory flow coming from the ports was, it was definitely, it carried further and was at faster flow comparatively to when it was at the lower flows. And again, filtration may aid in this discussion further. The speculation as to whether the helmet does a better job at minimizing exposure or not, they also looked at. And the helmet set up with a dual lens circuit in this, in, in this model did show still uh, some potential for leakage, specifically around the neck area, but they were able to minimize that by applying a cushioned effect at the neck and that greatly reduced the ex exhaled air into the environment. So over the time that we've been dealing with COVID-19, there's been lots of different ideas on how to set up for the mask interfaces. And some of those suggestions come from the concern around leakage, but also the placement of filters. In previous studies, you would all have shown that the simulated exposure risk around the features of masks and prongs and pillows, for example, it changes as the interfaces change, and the filters themselves have different criteria to be considered. So typically, the image that you're seeing up here to the top left-hand corner, um, where it's showing the filter kind of applied to the expiratory port, is kind of a recommended version, whether that would be in, in a single limb circuit setup, is to be able to actually filter kind of off the main flow versus potentially putting it in line directly with the mask. And, and some of the rationale for the concerns or potential challenges with the mask being applied directly to the interface itself was around the thought that it may increase dead space and affect worker breathing in these patients that are already kind of having a rough time, obviously affecting uh, the, the efficacy of treatment as well. But when we look to triggering and pressure delivery, this resistance to flow may become a, an additional problem. And if you remember back to what they're saying with the guidelines, we really want to minimize those issues for these patients and not have them be aggravated to the point of requiring more flow, which may make injury worse. But the other piece um, in consideration with this design is that the, the filter may need to be re replaced more frequently, um, resulting in more frequent circuit disconnects and potentially exposing us a little bit more so than if it's placed off towards the expiratory side. Now, if we're using a dual limb system and a non-ventilated mask, we have an expiratory limb, if you will, and it's a little bit more of a contained environment. So some people also speculated about low-cost heat valve setups, and, and obviously a supply limitation is uh, something we have to contend with. It's something to think about. But in doing that, we need to kind of consider the nature of what we're kind of doing. And if we're using a non-vented mask with this heat valve setup, we really need to think about having either an inline pop-off for safety if it's non-vented, or if it is vented, we have to run that risk of potential exposure. When it comes to the peep valve itself, the system kind of opens and is activated, if you will, on exhalation. And so there still may be some exposure concerns to the environment. Additionally, when we look at the filters themselves that we use in these circuit configurations is that testing conditions are based on temperature and humidity. And some filters are, are definitely rated with different levels of efficacy, most being greater than 98% for bacteria and viruses. And some have hydrophobic properties that can help repel this water. Filters, we need to stay vigilant to keep them in good working order for um, them to help us out. So whether to humidify, heated or not, has been a, a free topic at our institution. And obviously the data surrounding this is inconclusive. Some have suggested that heated circuits potentially can reduce condensation 
reducing the number of circuit breaks. But however, we do know that patients with thicker secretions, they start working hard and, and especially if they're intubated, have issues with uh, airway obstructions. But whether we do heated humidification, something that has, has come out of this is that the water vapor that's generated in the circuit is actually smaller than what viruses and bacteria typically are. And so it's not believed that the water vapor itself can potentially put you at added risk. However, obviously dealing with the condensate when it comes out of uh, vapor is a slightly different potential. Some pros and cons to inline with a ventilator versus a traditional high flow setup, maybe through a blended system is that it's a little bit more of a closed system to a, versus a single limb. Obviously, the key things of mobility and, and humidification can still be optimized. The surgical mask continues to be used in this application, but it might help us in minimizing um, circuit handling, especially if condensate is there. Another thought is that whether or not with resource limitations do we want to tie up a ventilator at the bedside for high flow but if our situation warrants that that's not a problem, it is also an easier switch if intubation is actually needed. And vice versa with single limb versus double limb circuits, some speculate that there's a little bit more accuracy with triggering. So in terms of worker breathing considerations, something to kind of potentially think about. The leak adaptation is probably one of the things that stands out the most differently from the two different systems. A non-invasive pressure ventilation machine uh, specifically has high leak adaptation because it's used to dealing with leaky masks. Ventilators don't typically have the same level of leak adaptation because they're dealing more with a closed uh, circuit situation. But when it comes to COVID-19, something to think about in terms of exposure to that. If the leak compensation can remain somewhat low, potentially we, we might run less risk. Obviously, we're restricted to non-vented masks typically, as vented masks don't usually um, pass the leak tests of invasive ventilators. And the big ones are, again, the need to switch to intubation is relatively easy if we're already using the dual lens circuit. And the leak valve issue is not something we typically have to contend with with a filtered uh, dual lens circuit. So we can't end the conversation without really talking about what patients care about. Our institution, like I'm sure many of you, patients have come in with a fear of the ICU specifically. They care about being able to be mobile, even if it's just in their room. And for some patients, this is the continuity of their routine. And if resource limitations require triaging of who gets what, some of these devices definitely could become the ceiling of care. For, for these patients with COVID. And talking about how the, the two modalities both have a place in COVID patient management, how we utilize them and the mechanism is a little different. High flow generating a small end expiratory pressure that is flow based um, versus a fixed pressure with a, an expiratory valve system with non-invasive uh, positive pressure ventilation. From an oxygenation perspective, we are using the idea of minimizing air entrainment and flushing out uh, the nasal pharynx with a high concentration of oxygen um, and potentially a small clearance of CO2 associated with high flow versus non-invasive positive pressure ventilation aids it with more of a blended or blood and gas combination. It has defined pressure um, to aid us with recruitment. CPAP might be better tolerated from a synchrony perspective, especially with some interfaces, but overall, the changing in pressure could be considered as an alternative for patients that don't have indications for um, intubation. From a practical perspective, high flow is, uh, is frequently associated to being more comfortable in design, also using a single circuit. Some other Considerations is we don't have to typically go into the rooms as frequently in dealing with alarms and mask fit. And the surgical mask offering in terms of covering may mitigate some of the risk that we potentially could be exposed to at the bedside. Versus a non-invasive positive pressure group, we have different setups responding to leaks and mask interfaces very differently. We do have a, a potential for higher risk of exposure and, and have options, though, when, when it comes to the design on how we use non-invasive um, in COVID patients.
RFI2 might also be a little limited in that some devices bleed in a certain amount of oxygen, and so we may not be able to achieve some of those higher FiO2s that we might be able to with different machines. So there's a lot of variability around non-invasive um, positive pressure ventilation to consider. And obviously, the, the PPE and negative pressure rooms or HEPA units can go a long way to helping us stay safe as well. So to kind of put everything together, non-invasive respiratory modalities have a role in COVID management. We have to balance the risks and the benefits, and they may change over the course of a patient's treatment. Some of the risks can be mitigated, but obviously trying to keep patients from being intubated is becoming more prevalent in the COVID conversation as time is going on. Exposure risk is always possible with everything that we do, but when we apply appropriate safeguards, we can reduce some of this. And as supply limitations change um, under high patient volumes, we may want to consider the approach we take very differently depending on those available ventilators. Having them tied up at the bed bedside may be helpful in certain situations to be able to do high flow and non-invasive, but when we need ventilators, maybe not so much. But at the end of the day, non-invasive respiratory support devices treat symptoms, they don't treat diseases. And as more studies shed light on what works best for COVID patients, we might have a better understanding on what to pick and when. But until then, it might really come down to the right device at the right time for the right reasons to be our best way forward. And so with all of that, thank you for everything that you do. I hope that you stay safe and healthy during the time of treating COVID patients and appreciate your attention today.